2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now, I'm going to talk to you tonight about past, present, and future. And past, present, and future for a child of God, and past, present, and future for an unsaved man. And the difference is between them. Uh, this will represent the past, this will represent the present, and this will represent the future. And the difference in these, for a saved man and an unsaved man, uh, there's a difference. Uh, that's uh, considered bad manners these days. These days, the unpardonable sin is pointing out differences. And what goes on today all over the world is the world's all trying to get together. They all want to get together, and what they want to do is make everything the same. They want to make all the black folks white and all the white folks black. They want to make all the women like men, make all the men like women. They want to make all the Orientals like the Occidentals, make all the Occidentals like the Orientals. The whole movement across the world today is one global community, a big, great big computerized electronic jungle with a bunch of clones in it that'll do what they're told. And that's what's going on. So when you begin to talk about differences, then you, uh, you put the fat on the fire. And I'm going to talk about that tonight. And I'm going to talk about differences. When I say differences, I mean there's a difference between the saved man and the lost man. And there's a big difference. And the difference extends not only in the future, but extends into the past and it extends into the present. And that's what I'm going to talk about here tonight. Now, first of all, there's one place where you start even. You start lost. There's no difference for all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. And when an unsaved fellow starts, he starts unsaved, and then he either gets saved or he doesn't get saved. But the beginning, and this is true of the saved man or the unsaved man, you were lost and condemned. And if you're sitting here tonight and you're saved, I'll tell you what your past was. Your past was you were lost and condemned. That was your past. The Bible said, He that believeth the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The uh, Bible says, An unsaved man, the wrath of God abides on him, whether he feels it or not. An unsaved man is clad in the filthy rags of his own self-righteousness, He's dead in trespass and sin. He's alone in the world without hope and without God. And the Bible said you, you were by nature children of wrath. So an unsaved man is condemned and lost, and before you were saved, that's what you were. You were an unsaved man. You were lost and condemned. You'd been tried. You'd been convicted. You talk to unsaved people, they say, well, I'm going to see how I'm going to make out. Nobody has to wait to see how you're going to make out. You've already made out. You've already been tried. Uh, some of you think, well, one of these days I'm going to die, and then I'm going to face the judgment. When I get the judgment, I'm going to find out whether I've been good or bad, and then God can decide what to do with me then. God's already decided what to do with you. He that believeth not shall not see life, but is condemned already. You've had your trial. People said, now, wait, wait till I get tested and then see how I, how I come out. You don't have to be tried to find out if you're guilty. You've been tried. The white throne judgment is just to prove to you that the sentence is correct. It's kind of like an appeal to a Supreme Court, and the appeal is turned down every time. You're on death row. If you're on the safe sitting here tonight, the wage of sin is death. And on death row, you know what you're waiting for? You're waiting to be executed. You're like a condemned man in a cell, you know, a condemned man in a cell thinking, well, wait till I get trial. When I get this trial, I'm going to speak up and say this. You've had your trial. When Christ died in Calvary's cross, every man on the face of this earth was tried and found guilty. And the Bible says the whole world may become guilty before God, every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world become guilty before God. So before you were saved, that was your condition. Now whether you're a good sinner or a bad sinner, I don't know. But your past was this. You were lost. Uh, do you ever stop and think about what had been a, a thing had been if God had taken you before he did? We'll talk about you saved people first. I mean, what if God had just uh, snatched you out before you were saved? I get thinking about it back in World War II. I was already to go, had all kinds of military training, all kinds of military background, and God kept me in the state till that mess was just about over, and it was over when I was on my way over, and never got in action, never got to fire a shot. And I was one of the most bitter men you ever saw about that thing, because I'd just been at it all my life. But I get thinking about it now, and I think to myself, now wouldn't that have been something? To get over there and get one of those little islands like Anyway Talk or Iwo Jima or one of those atolls over there or Guadalcanal or New Georgia or New Britain, one of them places, Cape Gloucester, and come one of those places and get around through the head and suddenly find myself in a pit burning. 
I mean, one minute just cussing and drinking and living like the devil and just having a time of it and making fun of God, making fun of the Bible, which I was doing, which I was doing. And the next minute I wake up and find myself on a fire and a bunch of people screaming and demons all around me. And I'm thinking, my God, this is a dream. I'm going to wake up. And then I burn and burn and burn and burn and burn and I begin to cry out to God, 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 help. You, don't be an atheist down there. And, oh, God, get me out of here. And, oh, God, what am I doing here? And that kind of stuff. And burning and burning. And then all of a sudden, wham, that thing falls apart. And there I'm standing out of a space like this with nothing on my feet. And look up at a light I can't look at and duck my head. God is holy. I'm a sinner. I die in my sins. There's nothing between me and God. We have no relationship in that kind of thing. I'm a stranger. I'm an alien. And I'm out like this, look at that light, and I can't look at it, look down this way, and then have to face the record, and off I go in the lake of fire. Man, what a joke. And that's what's going to happen to somebody here tonight if you don't get saved. Before you were saved, you were lost. And that isn't all. Before you were saved, nobody was much interested in finding you. This thing we're talking about in Russia tonight, same kind of thing. We're going to do the best we can in this church. You know we are. We always try to do the very best we can by missionaries. But we don't ever do enough. We don't ever do enough. And the people who have the money, enough money to do enough don't ever do it. It's the most aggravating thing. I mean, I'll be preaching down to Fort Myers someplace, or Tampa, or Port Agunda, one of them places, and I'll walk around that marine around there, and I'll see ships in there. Well, the cheapest ship in that harbor is $150,000, and the rest of them go up. And them Yankees buy them things and come down there and sail them things in February and March, and you know, the snowbirds, you know, and go back up in the north in the winter, they come down there February and March and sail them things about two days a week, and then leave them sit there at the anchor, June, July, August, September, and October. That's right. Millions of dollars. The psalmist said, no man cared for my soul. I was raised in America, in America, in the Midwest, the Midwest America, good old Republican Kansas, <laughs> where Bethel Bible College started the charismatic movement. I never heard the gospel I was 27 years old. I never saw a tract till I was 27 years old. I never saw a Bible till I was about 23 years old. That can happen in America. You say, why? No man cared for my soul. Nobody cared for you. They're going to let you die and go to hell. They didn't care. Did you know when a lost child gets lost, the whole neighborhood turns out and looks for it? When a little old baby gets lost, you see in the picture in the paper, two-year-old missing, three-year-old missing, four-year-old missing, 11-year-old. If you have, you've seen this girl phone such and such a place, and right now they're scouring, uh, you know, a whole neighborhood, you know, and trying to find a trace of a little girl over here in Gulf Breeze, somebody picked up. Everybody gets concerned, call out the fire department, call out the CIA, call out the Secret Service, call out the FBI, call out the police to get this one little girl. And here you are growing up, going to hell and burn like a bullet and going to burn like a bonfire. Nobody cares anything about you at all. They let you go. You know what your past was? If you were say you were lost and you were condemned. Now, the unsaved people that work the same way. You're sitting here tonight and you're unsaved. You know what your past is? It's a mess. Your life is not a message. It's a mess. Uh, the average life of the average unsaved man reminded me of an article I saw one time about a famous coach who was hired by a baseball team and then kicked off and they said asked him to give briefly his history and he said my history was I was desired wired hired inspired tired mired fired <laughs> and that's 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 the average life I mean you people sitting here tonight that are on the say has it really turned out like you intended it to you folks in your 40s and 50s, if you're lost, did you, did you really, did it come out like you started out there and thought it was going to be when you were 18 or 19 years old? Did it really come out that way? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, you fell apart. The past was a mess. You're not what you used to be, and you're going to get worse and get more weak and get more feeble as time goes by. I heard of a woman one time, and she, uh, she, when she put on her tax return, she claimed 50 cent depreciation on her husband because he was half the man he used to be. <laughs> but those things, looking back, coming up through those things, a lot of things went to pieces, didn't they? I mean, a lot of aspirations and dreams and hope you have. Didn't they hit the rocks, a lot of them? I think so. 
Your past was a mess, not a message. And you know what some of you are right now? You're too tired to work and, and too much in debt to quit working. That's middle life. I guess middle life, you call that thing middle age, you know. When you get too tired to work and you can't quit working because you owe your money. It's a mess. Now, maybe you've been to live a pretty good life, but your last life, you know, your past life is still a mess. Why, America has the greatest drug civilization to face this earth. And it didn't, it didn't just come up overnight. It came, first of all, from drinking. It came drinking beer and whiskey. That's what opened the drug traffic. And you know what happened after that? You had this television pill thing. Got a headache? Pill. Got a toothache? Pill. Got an earache? Pill. You want to get weight? Pill. You want to take off weight? Pop pill. Go to sleep? Pop it up. You want to wake up? Pop pill. Pop, 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 pop. And the medicine cabinet just filled with that stuff. What do you think's going to happen? The whole country's going to get filled with it. What is that? That's a whole generation of people that are just shot. They're shot. Their past is a mess. They're lost. They got a joke about a fellow taking his pill. His wife phoned the doctor and said, good heaven, doctor, come quick. Said he took his, his heart pill and his nerve pill and his vitamin pill and his antibiotic pill and his headache pill and he lit his cigarette and blew the kitchen all to pieces. <laughs> I had so much drugs in him, he just, boom, just exploded. <laughs> All right, now what is your past if you're unsaved? Your past is a mess. Not on how big a mess you made a thing, but you made a mess of something. You can look back and see it didn't work out like you thought it was going to work out, and you were so smart, and it was just how you're going to do it. And it didn't work out that way at all. Your past is a mess. Now, from that standpoint, saved and unsaved people start even. A saved man, but his past is he was lost. He was condemned. His life was a mess. It wasn't a message. It was just a mess. And he was alone in the world without hope and without God. Now you get saved. I'm talking about the present. And the top thing here, I want to talk about your present as a child of God. Your present as a child of God is different. In your present state, you're forgiven and you're being saved. When I say being saved, look at your text. 2 Corinthians 1.10. You notice there are three tenses in that text. You see those three tenses? Who delivered us from so great a death? Who doth deliver, present tense, and we trust he shall deliver, future tense? See those three things? He says, one, you were delivered. Two, you're getting delivered. Three, you're going to be delivered. Salvation's in three tenses. It's past, present, and future. When you trust Christ, you're saved, you're saved right on the spot. From what? The penalty of sin. That's past tense. You're not going to pay the penalty for sin in eternity. You're saved from that. That's the past tense. All right, then you're being saved daily from the power of sin. That's the present tense. And someday, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, when Christ comes, you're going to be saved from the presence of sin. You see the things in three tenses. And the first tense is saved, and the second tense is being saved, and the third sense is you're going to be saved. Folks say, well, I hope I'm going to be saved. Well, the hope has to do with the body. I don't hope my soul is saved. I already know my soul is saved. But salvation is three tenses. My body hadn't been saved yet. So I'm waiting for the salvation of my body. So my case is much better than an unsaved man. The unsaved man is still dead in trespass and sin, and I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven, and I'm being saved. A process is going on all the time. Uh, the Bible says, all things are yours. I'm with Christ, he's with me, and he's the owner. It's all his. And all things are yours, whether life or death, the Christ or God, they all belong to God, and they all belong to Christ, and Christ is God, and you belong to him. We had a fine brother in Christ here years ago. The Lord took him home. His name was uh, Gilly, Brother Gilly. And Brother Gilly was a good witness for the Lord. He used to work at the Naval Air Station sometimes. And I guess every fellow I've worked at the Naval Air Station eventually wound up with some Navy cutlery, you know, with NAS on it. I mean, that's just, you know, SOP. And he was witnessing some fellow he was working with down there, and the fellow, you was getting tired of getting dealing with him, and, and Gilly would deal with him all the time. And finally, the fellow, he thought he'd get rid of Gilly, so he told Gilly, he said, I bet you've got some knives, forks, and spoons at home with NAS on them. And he said, well, yeah, I do, you know. And he said, well, that's sealing. You're taking something that isn't yours. And Gilly had to think real quick, set up one of them Nehemiah prayers, and he said, oh, yeah, that's mine. That's blown to me. <laughs> so it's the Naval Air Station. He said, well, no, it's, that's mine. As far as that goes, well, everything you got is mine. 
And the fellow said, what? What do you mean? He said, your car is mine. So after you're dead in hell, I'll be driving your car around. <laughs> and he said, when you're down in hell drinking, down there begging for a drink of water, I'll be over to your house getting water out of your faucet. And that guy said, what do you mean? <laughs> and Gilly quoted in that passage, all things are yours, whether life or death, belong to Christ. Well, that was a pretty, you know, loose application of that verse, doctrinally speaking. <laughs> but it got the job done. About a week later, that fellow came up to him and he said, you know something? He said, what? He said, you ain't going to drive my car. He said, oh, yes, I am. The fellow said, no, you're not, because I got saved. <laughs> That's the way to handle it. That's the way to handle it. Now, you take the child of God. The child of God is forgiven and being saved. A child of God to get down on his knees and says, oh, Lord, forgive me for this, and forgive me for that, and I committed this sin, and I committed this sin, and God forgive me of this sin, and wash me in the blood and take away this sin. And he gets all through and reads the promise. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, then cleanse us small in righteousness. And after he reads the promise, he begins to doubt and says, Lord, did, did, you really, did you really forgive my sins? And the Lord says, what sins? <laughs> I mean, he said, I'll not just forgive you, I'll cleanse you. They're gone. You don't bring them up again, they're gone. Now, you take an unsaved man, he hasn't got that. The Bible said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. An unsaved man doesn't have that. A saved man does. A saved man is being saved day by day. Why? He's forgiven. Years ago, a woman had a rich husband, and a lot of people owed him a lot of money. And uh, when he died, she thought she'd collect. She got his ledger, and it was filled with bets that people owed him. And she took it to a lawyer and said, I'd like to collect this money. All these people owe my husband money. It's something like forty, fifty thousand dollars they owe him. And this is back around 1890, when that was worth about uh, half a million. And that lawyer looked that thing over for a while and turned over the pages, and finally he said, uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. So-and-so. He said, nobody in the world could collect anything from this uh, ledger. And she said, well, they owe him the money. It says they owe him the money and give the amount how much they owed him. And he said, yeah, but look here. And he showed her the ledger and she looked a little bit more closely. And on that ledger, behind every one of those places where somebody had owed him money, he'd taken a red uh, pen, a pen in red ink, and scratched that thing out and written across there, forgiven, unable to pay. Forgiven, unable to pay. Forgiven, unable to pay. <laughs> You know what I am? I'm forgiven. You say, why? Unable to pay. You say, what would you plead? I, I, I claim the, blank, the bankruptcy clause. <laughs> I claim bankruptcy. Said, you owe this money. Can't pay it. You can't get it? No, nope, can't get it. But what do you say for yourself? I'm bankrupt. That's what I say for myself. Somebody's got to bail me out. Somebody's got to post bond or I can't get out. And I got me an advocate. Now listen, if you're unsafe, you haven't got that. My presence is like that, and the Bible says he'll take me and he'll lead me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Like I was telling you the other night, I was sitting around the pastor one time in a place, I forget where it was, I think it was down in South Florida, and we were sitting around a cold uh, uh, winter night and the rain was coming down outside, out, outside, and the cars were slushed up down the sidewalk in the rain. And, I remember looking out there and thinking to myself, boy, if this ain't Dullesville, I mean, sitting here in this, uh, I forget what it was, some old Shoney, Wendy, Booger Burger place, I don't know what it was about the same to me. Uh, eating some of the junk food at 10 o'clock at night with the pastor and his family, had two girls and a boy, I think, something like that, young pastor. I remember looking out there across those streets, you know, and thinking about what I knew was going on out there, and I know what's going on out there. And I got thinking about that, and I saw myself, man, what a drag, man, what a drag. <laughs> and then I had a second thought about it, and looked out across there, and I said to myself, boy, aren't you glad when you go home at night there's not a bomb in the car waiting for you? And aren't you glad when you go home at night there's somebody behind a door waiting to put something on your back? And aren't you glad when you go home at night you don't have to worry about your wife getting the wrong letter or getting the wrong telephone call? And I sat there and thought to myself, you know, this is great. This just is great just to sit here in Dullesville with nothing to do <laughs> and, and just, I mean, walk, walk in the path of good men. I couldn't imagine myself walking the path of good men, but he'll make me to walk in the path. He'll put me in the path and guide me. That's my present. 
That's my present. And listen, if you're on the save, you haven't got that. You haven't got that. Is a fornicator in this building tonight? The blood of Jesus Christ, God, the Son, will offend you from all sin. Is there a whoremonger in this building tonight? The blood of Jesus Christ, God, the Son, will offend you from all sin. Is there an adulterer in this building tonight? Or an adulteress? The blood of Jesus Christ, God, the Son, will offend you from all sin. Is there a gambler here tonight? Is there a dope peddler here tonight? Is there a murderer here tonight? You know, one time one of those old roughnecks in London came here and an Episcopal preacher preached, and he was preaching about saving people and throwing out the lifeline. And I think he said the lifeline was the church. And he said, if you were drowning, that the, the church is a lifeline that God threw to you to get you safely on the shore. And one of those old bums that came in the back end of that church heard that stuff for a little while. And then he got up and walked out the door. As he walked around the, out the door, the rector said, uh, I say, sir, uh, do you have to leave? And that old bum turned around and said, Laddie, your rope ain't long enough. <laughs> and went out the door. You know what he meant? He meant, I'm drowned. You ain't got a rope to reach me. You can't throw that far. I got one to reach you. I bet you mine will reach you. I don't care what you do in the rope I got will get where you are, ma'am. I don't care what kind of sin you got, my rope will get to you. I mean, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for sinners. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. So my presence is great. My presence is I'm walking the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, and I've got the Holy Spirit in me, and the Holy Spirit in me is going to guide me and lead me into all truth. Now let's take your case if you're an unsaved person. You understand what I'm talking about tonight? I'm talking about differences. I'm talking about where people are different. Now you're unsaved. Now what's your present condition? Well, your present condition is you're insecure, and you're deteriorating. You are deteriorating. You say, what do you mean? But I mean, you're getting older and falling apart. I mean, that's life. I mean, uh, you may try to kid yourself about a time, but you're, you're getting older, and the body ain't what you used to be, and it, it's going to get worse through the years. And every January the first comes around, you take a new crack at things and decide you're going to fix things up, you know. And, oh, you always make a mess things for January the 5th sometime before January the 2nd, and you turn over new leaves and new leaves and new leaves and new leaves, and what you don't need is a new leaf, what you need is a new life. The new leaf isn't going to do it. You know what the leaf factor is in the Bible? It's the fig leaf factor. <laughs> and the fig leaf factor is uh, trying to cover up your nakedness with your good works. You're insecure. You're deteriorating, slowly but surely. Um, your hair's coming out. And your teeth are coming out, and your chest is falling on you, and your feet are getting flat. You're getting stiff back, but you can't sit up very long. It hurts right down here, you know. <laughs> and the bladder doesn't work like it should, and the kidneys don't work like they should, and how these headaches all the time, you know. And the doctor says you need glasses. <laughs> and on it goes. Let's just face it. You know what your present is? You just fall apart like a junk car. You say, well, I'm 20 years old. I'm not begun to go to junk yet. But you will shortly. You will shortly. <laughs> I mean, you'll deteriorate. And in the, in the day and age in which you live, there'll be a number of factors, factors that work on you. I mean, you're going to have to live with them. And they're going to work you out and beat you to pieces. I tell them, last year I gave each of my kids something worth $17. They said, what's that? I said, a $100 bill. <laughs> That's about what it's worth, about 17 bucks. Why, what have you, you people that are on the save here tonight, why, why do you hang on to what you have so tenaciously when there's nothing to it? Your money isn't any good. Paper money. Paper money ain't good at all. Going to put a computer in there. Look, get, get out the Guinness Book of Records and look at it. And the greatest robbery anybody ever robbed anybody of was done by a computer. I mean, you say, well, it can store so many figures and facts in so short a time. Yeah, it can make you uh, rob more money in less time than ever robbed before. <laughs> All they got to do is change figures on there, press the right button, pull the right lever, print the right this and that, and they done mess you up out about $40, $50 million. You haven't got anything to look forward to. War in the Near East, war in the Middle East, war in the Far East. 
The Far East is too far away and the Near East is too near and they worry about the population explosion and trying to cut down the births and at the same time they're trying to multiply them and trying to take care of the ozone layer. What, what do you got to face forward to anyway? Your president is insecure, is shaky, your government is shaky, some of your families are shaky, and you made a mistake. You made a mistake in thinking that you'd get into sin and then get out quick. And if some of you got into sin, you're not out of it yet. And it's going to take you some time. I don't know how many times an invitation I've gone to a fellow, and the invitation said, wouldn't you like to accept Christ? You'll say, well, I'm just not quite ready yet, preacher. But what's the trouble? Well, i got a few things in the family i got to get straightened out. I said, maybe you'll never get them straightened out. Well, I don't know till I get them straightened out first. You can go to hell waiting to get them straightened out. I mean, you figured you got in and do the wrong thing, and you, you rejected Christ and thought you'd live without him, and you figured uh, when the time came to get saved, you'd just get saved when you wanted to get saved. You know what you found out? You found it was a lot easier to get into sin than it was to get out of sin. And a lot of people have found out. A court jester for Francis I, who was about to send an army into Italy, uh, they were talking there, and the, the, the king and his princes and dukes were talking about the army, and they're figuring out ways the army to get the army into Italy. And the court jester said, Your Majesty, if I were you, I'd be figuring out ways to get the army out of Italy. I mean, maybe you can get in it, but then how do you get back out of it? Some people like that get to sin, then hang on right on to the end, and then uh, go down with the stream. I mean, they're going to go to work on you, and there are going to be other factors that work on you. And you have to face them day after day after day. And listen, one day in the hospital will cost you something, and two months in the hospital will bankrupt you. They got that thing, you talk about a blackmail job, man. They got things set up now, if you spend two months in the hospital, you're, you're that expression for it, I can't repeat, but mortgaged uh, up to a certain place. <laughs> uh, you're a mortgage up to a certain place, I mean, for all the rest of your life. Uh, what have you got to look forward to anyway? Wars, rumors of wars, government interference, taxes, higher prices, inflation. Where are you going? Nowhere. You just go in circles. Trouble, trouble, trouble. You thought it'd be easy to get in and get out, and you found out getting out wasn't so easy. They have a joke about a little boy one time. They asked him, they said, uh, you have a stepfather? He said, yeah, I've got a good stepfather. And they said, do you spend time? Yeah, he spends time with me. They said, well, how do you spend time? He said, he takes me out the lake every, every uh, uh, weekend and lets me swim. And he said, does he swim? No, he stays in the boat. Well, what do you swim? He said, I swim back to land. He said, of course, it's kind of hard walking back to the house. But he said, the hardest part is getting out of that burlap sack. <laughs> what you, where you, where you go, excuse me. <coughs> what you're going to find is that by the time you decide I'm going to get up and walk back, you're going to be in a burlap sack ground, man. I and mean, you get fooled with sin, and the first thing you know, it's got you. That's your present condition. Now, maybe it hasn't got you real bad yet, but that's your present condition. The Bible said, either commit sin is the servant of sin. And he said, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. What's your present state? Your present state is insecurity and deteriorating, gradually falling apart. Back there around 19, uh, I guess about 1910 sometime, uh, I had a very remarkable thing happen in Niagara Falls, and of course a lot of honeymooners there that saw it when it took place. But at Niagara Falls there on a beautiful day, people began to scream and yell and pass the word on down the line that there was somebody in a boat upriver headed for the falls and they couldn't rescue them. And what that thing was, was a drunken Indian. And in Canadian England had gotten a canoe and got into that river and was drifting toward the falls in that canoe and couldn't paddle out and couldn't handle the rapids and was just hanging on for dear life, rocking back and forth. And they ran down the stream ahead of him and tried to shoot ropes across there for him to grab a hold of and tried to lay planks and things across there for him to get a hold of. And he couldn't make it. And the fellow went on and before the horrified eyes of several thousand people, he got right up to the end of that thing before it went over in that canoe. And he had a bottle of Indian wine there with him and about Eight seconds before I went over that thing, he took that bottle, 
and just turned that bottle up in the air like that and drank the whole thing. And just the canoe went over the top. He just picked the bottle up in the air like that. And over he went, boy, I mean, mashed to pieces. That's the way men are. They just drift down the stream like that and just drift along. Everything just fine, just fine. Then they get worried and get nervous and I'm going to stop and you can't stop. Here, buddy, we'll help you and they can't help you. We'll keep the thing and keep showing. Oh, you go, boy. Oh, you go. It's like that. Now I'm going to talk about the future. And the future of the saved man, the unsaved man is entirely different. They're not the same at all. You take you uh, saved people sitting here tonight. You know where you're headed for? You are headed for perfection and glory. You're headed for a sinless body and a sinless home and a sinless Savior and a sinless eternity. That's where you're headed. You're headed uh, to be just like Jesus Christ. I heard uh, Brother Williamson last night got off some pretty good stuff. He's, he's a, a deep student of the Bible, that fellow is. He's no hill believe from over there in South Alabama, but he reads his Bible. And he was talking about the image of God, and I, I knew what he was saying was so. I mean, I read it many times and knew it to be true, but, but it kind of struck me in a new way. You know what he said? He said, you know, Christ, the image of God, well, I knew that. And then he says, God has predestinated us to be, uh, you know, conformed to his image, Christ's image. But Christ, the image of God. You know what that means? That means if I get his image, I become God's image. I'll be like God. Whew. Won't that be great? I mean, think of being uh, able to appear and disappear and travel faster than light and be sinless and never have a dirty thought and never have a wrong motive and never think anything wrong and never say anything wrong and never do anything wrong and enjoy it. <laughs> That's great, man. That's great. You don't, you, you know, talking about all these charismatics, you know, making, you know, $20 million a year and get a leopard seat crawling out junk. That's small stuff. How'd you like to be in a place where you could do whatever you wanted to do, as long as you wanted to do it, think anything you wanted to think, say anything you wanted to say, and never have to even check it to see if it was right. Just turn it loose, let her rip, and let her go, and everything is perfect. That's where I'm going. Every time that clock ticks. I'm getting closer and closer. Eight seconds closer than was before. Every time you turn a page in that calendar, I'm one day closer. All the, all the clocks that tick, all the sand clocks that drip sand, all the calendars of the world point to the day and time when I'm going to be just like him. A perfect, sinless body. A perfect, sinless soul, a perfect, sinless spirit. I'm headed home to glory. All things depend upon uh, your destination. I mean, I've traveled planes up and down this, year, the, this country for years and years and years. That's the understatement of the year. I mean, I've been up there, like I say, longer than a seagull with sore feet, man. When I get on those airplanes, I'm, I've been up in the air longer than the pilot. I'm, I've been up the, in, the, in the air more years than the pilot is old. <laughs> I mean, a lot of those pilots you are under 40, under 40 years old. I've been flying since 1944. What's that? 48 years? Yeah, 48 years. If I pilot's under 48 years, I'm flying before he's born. I've been up there and he's sucking a bottle. And flying up down there and flying up down the back and forth of that country, uh, all up and down, I see some things and learn some things. And I'm looking forward to a day when I'm going to fly away permanently and get in the right place at the right time. Perfection, headed for glory. When I get in those planes, I look around, and I see all these people sitting here, and I wonder myself, where are they going? I mean, they're all going to New York, or they're all going to Philadelphia, or going where I'm going, they're going to Atlanta, or Las Vegas, or Frisco, or some other place. But you know something? It isn't so much uh, the place you're going down here, it's what's waiting for you when you get there. I mean, everybody who dies is going to go, going to meet God. The Spirit shall return to God who gave it. That's what's going to happen. You're going to go back to God. But the question is, what kind of a reception are you going to get? That's the question. I'm on a plane, look across here, and here's a fellow sitting over here, and he's looking out the window like this, and looking around the place like this, and he's 
smiling, talking to people who got the winner like this. I found later he's a POW, and he's just been released, and they're shipping him back from Korea or Vietnam, and he's coming home. He's so excited. He happened to see his wife for two or three years, four or five years. He can't wait to get where he's going. And two seats behind him, I see two fellas sitting there, and there's a pair of handcuffs there, treating them on the, on the armrest. Poor boy going to face a murder rap out there at Fort Leavenworth. Now, don't you know the thing that counts is what kind of reception you're going to get when you get there? Back on that, back on that uh, plane somewhere, there's a fellow sitting there, and he's kind of slobbing the mouth, looking out the window. He's got a medical doctor sitting by him, taking him off someplace, confining him in a sane asylum. And back there someplace, a young girl, she's all excited, looking out the window, talking to everybody, reading all the magazines, nervous, uh, clamming low tide, and shifting around. And, She's going to get married. She's going someplace. When she gets off the plane, it's going to be a wedding group and kinfolk and people and the fellow she's going to marry, run to meet her, all this stuff, you know. What a great homecoming. But that guy heading for the pen, for the slammer gets out there and here come the hacks and pick him up, haul him off in an armored car and put him behind bars. Are you saved? <laughs> if you're saved, you've got a reception waiting for you. You've got a reception waiting for you. And if that Bible's right, that reception, there's going to be palms of glory raised and shouting and hallelujahs and praise the Lamb, and you're going to see the one that loved you and died for you and shed his blood for you, and you're going to go to a place where there's no sorrow, no pain, no crying, no death. Don't tell me you won't enjoy a trip. You, don't tell me you can't enjoy a trip to a place like that. How come you're not enjoying the trip? I mean, think about where you're headed. <laughs> you're headed for perfection. And someday you're going to see it. Hallelujah around the throne. Praise, glory, honor, and blessing to the Lamb. Him would sit upon the throne. Glory to God. And it's going to be, it's going to be perfect. You say, I get so tired, Brother Ruffin. I get so impatient waiting. I do too. I do too. You take these fellows talk about Russia, you know, and these places over there, and the response to the gospel. You get so hungry to see that, you're ready to just drop everything and go. I bet some of you feel that way right now. And I don't blame you for feeling that way. I feel that way myself. But I've learned something. You've got to do what God tells you to do. I mean, at probably a time when Brother Root, I know it was time Brother Root had to sit there in class and learn that Greek and Hebrew. He had to sit there. And it was a drag. And then here he is over in Russia having the time of his life. But you have faith in that just little before you have faith in that just much. So don't go off half cocked like you're going to do a big thing. But I understand it. I understand that response. Why, you say, well, I get so impatient waiting for the Lord to come. I do, too. People say, Ruffin, I thought you said he was going to come in 1989. I thought he was. I really did. Honest to God, did. You say, what do you think now? I'm disappointed. <laughs> I hope he'll come this year. But as sure as I'm standing here, the time's running out. It's getting closer and closer and closer. You say, well, I, I, just, I, I, guess, I guess I just... Uh, I, I, I'm patiently waiting. It's been years and years. Listen, the folks in the Old Testament that died before Christ came had to wait 4,000 years for the Lord to show up. 4,000 years. And those souls down in paradise, Abraham's bosom, are sitting down there, and every tick of the clock is getting closer and closer and closer. But they waited 4,000 years. Bless my soul. Nobody in this building waited a hundred years yet. You wait a little longer. The final end is going to be perfection. You get talking about these things, and these materialistic, modernistic, hell-bound, demon-possessed socialists say, well, they say, Ruckman, you're just promising pie in the sky by and by. That's very true. As a matter of fact, that's when you get your pie at the end of the meal. The trouble is these modernistic, humanistic, demon-possessed socialists and demon-possessed one-worlders and one-world one world clone of global environmental ecological jackasses, and I said that with charity, of course, but, but you know what their trouble is? Their trouble is they want their cake and eat it too. They want it all right now. Why? They're spoiled. They're spoiled rotten. They think they can have their own way. Pie is in the sky by and by. And boy, what a day that'll be. You know what your future is? Your future is sinless perfection. Absolute sinless perfection. Years ago, years ago, I had a, a friend, I, I guess he's still alive, his name is Bill Manns. He's a gospel singer. Maybe he's dead, but now I don't know, but Bill Manns had a beautiful voice, and he 
could have sung opera, and he got into concert work, and he was saved, but he went with kind of a wild crowd, and the Air Force and the Air Force, they got him into the men's choral group singing for the Air Force up and down the country, and uh, he got kind of backslidden. And then when he was kind of down the mouth and kind of worried about things and knew he wasn't right with the Lord, he had a chance to go hear Jeanette McDonald sing. And Je Jeanette McDonald was a beautiful, gracious singer and a saved woman. And she gave him, uh, a fellow gave him tickets to a concert. His name was Joe Penner. Joe Penner was an old-time comedian. You probably don't remember him, but Joe Penner was a radio comedian. He gave him his tickets to hear Jeanette McDonald sing. And that night when Joe Penner told Jeanette that Bill Mann's out there in the audience. She changed her musical program, and instead of uh, singing a couple of concert numbers she was going to sing, she sang, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And the Holy Spirit got a hold of old Bill and just tore him up. When he went out of that thing, he went back behind the stage and talked to her and said, I've been backslidden. I told the Lord I'd sing for him, and I haven't been singing for him, but you got me back in the right track, and now in the rest of my life I'm going to sing for the Lord. And he did. And the next year he got a card from Jeanette, and it said, keep singing for the Lord, Bill. And Bill Manns did something very unusual. He sang for Helen Keller. And Helen Keller was a deaf and dumb woman, blind. I think she was blind and deaf, I think she was. And she'd only tell speech by, she put her uh, fingers in your lips and then read your lips. And a remarkable woman, I mean, being unable to hear and able to see, she couldn't see the word spelled, and she couldn't hear them spoken. She actually learned how to talk. I've heard her talk. I've seen uh, uh, chronicles of her uh, on tape where she's talking, and her talk is it's pretty rough, you know, but you can understand it. And so she asked him to sing for her through her speech, and so he got up to sing. Of course, he couldn't hear a word he was singing. And he sang... Uh, were you there when they crucified my Lord? You know, oh, it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And she put her finger out there, and she'd nod her head. She'd say, I was there. I was there. And he'd sing, and were you there when he rose again that from the tomb, rose again that day? Were you there if me rose again from the dead? Oh, 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 it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they... And she, she go, I was there. I was there. I was there. <laughs> when Christ rose from the dead, the book says you rose with him if you're in him. And you were there. And in glory, you're going to be there. He said, Father, I would that those thou gavest me be with me where I am. They may behold the glory thou gavest me before the foundation of the world. That's your future. Boy, don't the future look bright? <laughs> I mean, nobody ever accused me of being an optimist, but I am. I am. I'm just pessimistic about the world, brother. I'm a, I'm a pessimist about my salvation man. I'm an optimist. I'm the biggest optimist you ever saw. I know where I'm going, know how to get there. And bless God, someday I'm going to be there. Now we come to the sad part of it. You want to say, people sitting here tonight, what is your future? Well, this isn't your future I'm drawing here. You're not going to get by with it and say, well, everybody is God's child. They're not. You start out dead trespass and sin. You continue the filthy rags of your own self-righteousness. What's going to happen? Do you think God's going to let you in there with that crowd? That's praising Jesus Christ for his righteousness? Do you think God's going to let you in that crowd that's standing up there saying, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness? On Christ the solid rock I stand while the ground is sinking, saying, what would you be doing up there? You would be saying, hey, look at me. I kept the commandments. Hey, look at me. I got baptized. Hey, I take the sacraments. Yeah, I gave the cerebral palsy fund. I supported the Red Cross. I paid my debts. I took care of my wife. I worked a double shift in order. Who's going to pay attention to you? You ain't going to give in that bunch. That bunch is up there saying glory and honor and thanksgiving to the Lamb and him and stood upon the throne. Glory and power, honor, wisdom and blessing to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Unto him that loved us and died for us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. 
Now, you're unsaved. What's your future? Well, if that book is right, your future is a lake of fire. You say, well, I, I live a good life and I'm going to die a good death. Uh-huh. You'll be like a great man and die, you know, and they're going to talk about what a wonderful fellow you were at your funeral and how kind and magnanimous you were and how you helped folks and how philanthropic you were and what a fine fellow you were. And mind, the time comes to die, a great fellow like you. <laughs> you think all the chance in heaven would come down to pick you up, wouldn't you? This great man dies, you know, he gets shot in Dallas, you know, or he gets shot in Memphis someplace, gets his brain blown out. And you think when that fellow would take off, you think all the chariots in heaven come down and pick him up, and the trumpeters would blow, and there'd be harpers and angels waiting there to welcome him through the gate. And instead you hear a clap of thunder, and you see a fiery bolt sweep through the sky, heading down, and some shrieks going past you. If you're on the safe, you don't go up, you go down. He says to one bunch, come up hither. The other one, he says, depart from me, down. You say, I'm on way up, Brother Upman. You mean you're down, you'll be on your way down after a while. Well, a lot of them get to the top. One day the Lord called over Hitler and said, okay, boy, up. And got him up where he owned half the world, man. I thought it took over Russia, and it took over Finland, took over Sweden, took over Norway, took over France, took over Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Greece and Albania and most of North Africa and half of Russia. And the one God, one day God said, down, boy. <laughs> And down he came, all the way down, soaked in gasoline, burning the right star garden. That's the end of him. Here's Mussolini. One day God said, up, up, boy. And up he comes, old jaw sticking out, Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator, you know, up there having him a time, bombing Ethiopia and out of the britches, the, the, one of the world's greatest dictators. And one day, one day God said, down, boy, down. And down he goes, hanging upside down, naked with his girlfriend down there in the piazza of Rome, trampled to death and shot by partisans. Yeah, maybe you're doing all right now. Maybe what I'm saying right now doesn't have much effect on you. Maybe your bills are paid. Maybe where you come from, you're a fine fellow. Maybe you come from, uh, your, uh, your charity is commendable, and maybe your conduct is commendable, and maybe... Uh, you're almost faultless in the eyes of the community, or your wife, your children. Maybe you're at the top right now. And one day, you know what it's going to be? If you're unsaved, it's going to be down, boy, down. You come up, and down you go. One time over there in Ireland, a famous man who'd spent most of his life making fun of the Bible in the church died, and they tried to get some people to bury him, and he wasn't a Catholic, so they had to get a Protestant minister to bury him. And at that time, every Protestant they found about in Ireland was a Bible believer and wouldn't bury him. And they finally got one old country preacher there. They didn't figure it had much sense. And they figured they'd let him bury him. And they talked to him about this infidel. And he knew the infidel. And they said, will you bury this fellow? He said, no, I'll not bury him. They said, why not? He said, I know what that fellow said. That fellow said, I live with God and I die. I'm going to die without God. And he said, to hell with your bag of tricks. I'm done for. That's the last word he said. And that Protestant minister says, I'll not bury that man. He said, I'll not pronounce the sacred words over his body. He lived damned and he died damned and he's damned right now and in hell. <laughs> Some of the Irishmen pretty, you know, plain talkers. He lived damned and he died damned and he's damned right now. That's some way to answer a funeral charge, isn't it? And he's in hell right now. And the fellow was. You know what your future is? If you're unsaved, your future is a lake of fire. William the Conqueror, the conquered England, was a great conqueror. And he lived high on the hog and low on the chicken. He took a doomsday book and took everybody's land he didn't like and converted it into forests where he could hunt. When he found somebody's land and farmland and stuff growing on, he just burn it off, robbed the land from them, then replant trees on it for a game, for a preserve, a forestry. At one time, he finished burning off somebody's land, and his horse came along there and put its hoof on a hot cinder in the ground and jolted like that and he hit the pommel of that saddle and hurt himself internally and in two days he was dead and he hadn't been dead for 24 hours his son got on the throne and his body lay around there about three days with nobody to bury it and finally the Roman Catholic uh, bishop in that part of the area had been close to William the Conqueror came around to bury the body of William the Conqueror out there on the church property and William the second his son stopped that bishop and said I'm reclaiming all the church property for England, 
and you'll not bury my father in that piece of land. My father was a robber, and you'll not bury him on church property. Up, Willie, up, boy, up. Oh, you at the top now, are you? Okay, down, boy. Down, boy. Down you go. Down you go. Your future, if you're unsaved and that Bible's right, your future is hell. That's your future, and that's where you're going to go. I heard of a fellow one time, a very wealthy man. They knew he was a land hog, and he got to be about six years old, and there was some land uh, out in a certain part of the country they knew he wanted, and they got him out there. The fellow was going to work on him and got him out there, and he said, Now tell you what, Mr. So-and-so, we'll let you walk, and he said, We'll give you all the land free that you can cover, that you can walk around by sundown. We'll give you all that land free. You can walk around it. We'll give you till sundown, and all the land you've walked around by the time the sun goes down, yours for nothing. They knew what he'd do. And that fellow just broke his neck to get around a piece of land about five miles by five miles by five miles on the side, and he got his land all right. He covered about ten miles, had a heart attack, and they gave him his piece of land. It was about three by six by eight. That's what he got. Up, boy. Down you go. Put him in bed with a shovel. Good night. On the bottom. The fellow died, he went to hell. If you're on the save, that's where you're going, according to that book. Now don't get mad with me. Don't get upset with me. Stop this stuff and say, well, hell, fire, and death. Don't give me that stuff. I didn't write the book. Jesus Christ spoke those words. The term hell, fire is not my expression. That came out of the Sermon on the Mount. But if the Bible is right, you know what your future is, an unsaved man? Your future is hell. <coughs> Are you here tonight anywhere near my age? I don't see a whole lot of folks here tonight my age, but if, if you're over 50, you know what you ought to be saying right now? You ought to be saying to yourself, well, what's a soul? Have I got a soul? What happens to a soul? What's going to happen to me when I die? How come people are always reading the Bible? What's in that book? How come them folks keep reading? That's what you ought to be asking yourself. Not how can I make another fast buck. You ought to be saying to yourself, am I going to live forever? What's eternity? What is it going to be like in eternity? Those are the questions. So you're asking yourself, what about the stock market, the Dow Jones average? Ain't going to come to nothing. Your future is a lake of fire. We have in this country a fellow who's a great soul winner. I've, I thought about getting him in here a number of times, and I just, with what I've got to do, I can't handle the correspondence on it. But Carl Hatch is one of the best, uh, best personal workers there is in this country. And that's about all he does is personal work, but he's good at it. And Carl Hatch can come almost, almost to any church and get folks stirred up pretty quickly about soul winning. Uh, I won't tell you how Carl, how Carl Hatch got saved. He had a buddy. I say a buddy, they pal around together, but they weren't too friendly because they were both uh, caught in the same girl. And uh, this one fellow decided he'd show off for this girlfriend. He got him a car, uh, a plane he could fly, a small Cessna. He was about 23 or 24, and flew over her house, was doing stunts above her house out there in the country, and uh, showing how smart he was. And Carl was in the ground watching that thing and cursing him. Both of them were on the save, young men. And something went wrong with that plane, and that plane crashed, and Carl was down the ground yelling, let her go, let her hit, boy, let her burn, boy. And that thing hit and burned, and that thing burned, and off there across the field, Carl could hear that fellow screaming in that burning plane. And he laughed and jumped up and down and said, burn you so-and-so, sir, if you right, you dirty so-and-so, burn, boy, I hope you burn good. And had his funeral a couple of days later, and Carl had been sobered up a little bit by then, but he went down to the funeral and told the funeral director, I knew so-and-so pretty well. He's a friend of mine. I'd like to see him. He said, no, we got a closed casket funeral. You can't see him. And he said, no, I need to see him. And he said, uh, I, I think you'll, you'll regret it if you do. And he said, listen, is there, the law says I can't see him. And the funeral director said, no. And he said, the law said that I'm able to see him. He said, yeah, according to the law, you can see him if you want to see him. But if you take my advice, you won't do it. He said, I don't give up you know, about your advice. Let me see him. So he pulled back the lid in that casket and let him look at him. And old Carl Hatch took one look. And of course, but then they fixed him up pretty good. But not good enough so you could tell he just burned like a sausage in a fireplace. And Hatch took one look down there and gasped and drew back. 
went back in the funeral parlor and sat on a chair and just sat there and didn't do anything. Well, the funeral was being taken place and the people came in, they're singing. He never even went in the main auditorium. He just sat out there in the, in the hallway and sat there and just sat there. You know what he was saying? He was saying, oh God, don't let me die like Billy died. Don't let me die like Billy died. I don't want to die like that. I don't want to burn like that. Oh God, don't let me burn like that. And boy, about four days later, Carl Hatch got saved. Because he got thinking about that thing. In his part of the country, the preachers preached about hell. And old Carl knew one thing. Carl knew if he didn't get saved, he's going to burn. And he didn't want to burn like his buddy burned. Now there it is. If you're unsaved or saved, that's your past. If you're saved, that's your present. If you're unsaved, that's your present. You could put them up here all night. That's the chief cause of crime in America, those. If you're saved, that's your future. And if you're unsaved, that's your future. All right, let's stand.